Well, there we go. Now we're ready to go. Welcome. Um, this is the Committee on Health and Human Services, Finance and Policy. Today's date is Monday, March 28th, 2022. Um, thank you everybody for joining us here today. We've got a full agenda, so we're going to want to jump right into it. Um, first up, we're going to uh, go back to where we left off on uh, thir uh, Wednesday. Um, Senator Coran with Senate File 61. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so Senate File 61, if, if, 61, if you remember where we left off, we, would, we wanted a review from DHS on the fiscal note. And so I believe um, instead of reviewing the entire bill, this bill itself is about um, uh, referred to as physician administered medications, just for everybody's reference. And uh, so I think at, at this point, what we'd like to do is have, uh, I think uh, Ms. Bailey is going to be on to talk about or give us an update on the fiscal note. I don't see anything that's technically changed on the fiscal note that I have at hand, but we would, I think we were looking for an overview, re overview of the math and the calculations on the particular fiscal note. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, Ms. Bailey is on, on uh, the screen here with us with Zoom. So welcome, Ms. Bailey, and uh, just, uh, Go ahead, please identify yourself and then go ahead with uh, your information. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Coran. Uh, for the record, Elise Bailey, Budget Director for the Department of Human Services. And um, I'm prepared today to go through the administrative costs uh, in the fiscal note. It, it sounded like the last hearing that was primarily um, what the committee was interested in hearing about. And so um, I think very quickly I'll go through um, what those costs are and how we came to them. So as mentioned last hearing, this um, proposal or this bill um, takes what our current structure is, which is that the drugs are administered in an outpatient setting, they appear on a single claim, and they include the drug and the fee for administration. Well, under this bill, the clinicians would be able to order the drug from a retail pharmacy for delivery to the clinic, um, the pharmacy would then bill DHS for reimbursement and therefore the claims would be separated between um, the pharmacy claims and the medical claim for administering the drug. So this language in the bill requires us at, at the commissioner um, rather than the practitioners or the pharmacy to ensure that the claims are not duplicated and without the medical or drug costs on the same claim the only way to really do that is through a post-payment review of all the claims we've received. And so in this fiscal note, you'll see that we have three and a half FTEs booked um, for this work. Um, a half of FTE is for the data analyst to run and analyze monthly reports to match the pharmacy claims with the professional claims to assist in understanding if there's any duplication. Um, we're anticipating that this work will be a minimum of 650 hours in a year and the types of tasks that this person would do would include um, developing the requirements with our policy um, subject matter experts to identify um, how to uh, design the reports. So they'll design the monthly reports um, and then write the programming and coding to pull the data and pull the monthly reports. They'll have to test those reports and refine as needed. Um, and then to develop a process for automating and monitoring the report runs each month. Um, and then of course, they'll have to respond to ad hoc data requests related to anything that the policy experts have found um, in the reports or that our SERS investigators have found that they need more information on. Then we have one FTE in our purchasing and service delivery group in our healthcare administration. And this policy person would review all of the claims that they see on that report um, to determine if the claims are indeed duplicate claims for the same drug provided to the same person. In order to do this, they will likely need to contact the providers that build in order to determine what to whom the drugs were dispensed and for whom the case um, for whom in the case of a pharmacy determine how the clinic obtained the drugs for a given MA patient. Um, so this would have to be done for each case. And then each case where an overpayment is identified, they would have to produce a monthly list to our SERS unit, who would then take it from there to investigate. Um, this staff person will also need to periodically work on the report, reports on drugs dispensed by a pharmacy for which we never see a claim for the administration side to make sure um, 
that, that in fact, that person did not receive the administrative uh, claim um, and to make sure that the clinics, um, that the waste has been disposed of and it wasn't used on another patient. So altogether, this policy person we're estimating um, would have work that amounts to at least 1,530 hours per year. Then in the fiscal note, we detail that we need two FTEs in SERS investigations. So these are the folks that are working on uh, the cases that that policy person in our healthcare administration has had identified as a possible duplicate claim. So currently a full provider investigation includes administrative work reviewing documentation from the providers on the medical need, the prescription and the administration of the drug. The time needed for current cases varies widely um, as to the complexity of the case and the responsiveness of, of the providers that we're working with. Tasks include for these staff are reviewing the report provided by the healthcare administration, coordinating information um, with the healthcare administration. They would then create their own investigative reports where they develop and send notices to the agent to notices of agency action um, to the providers, conducting a claims analysis, obtaining records from the providers, reviewing those records, and following up. So for each claim line, it is estimated that this will be approximately 12 hours. Um, so we estimate that in the bill, we estimate that we'll have about 4,000 claims a year. We assume that 10% of these claims will require these kinds of investigations. 10% of 400 claims times 12 hours per claim is about 4,800 hours per year that we will assume um, that is needed through SERS investigations. And that's how we came up with the two FTEs. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bailey. Uh, Senator Benson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And could you go through one more time? I thought I heard you say the Sears investigators would look at determining medical need, not just reconciling payment. Ms. Bailey? Um, uh, Senator Benson, typically in a Sears, Sears investigation, um, that is typically what our SERS investigators um, look at. I might have to phone a friend on more detail behind, behind that. Um, uh, Senator Benson. Mr. Chair, I would presume the doctor would be deciding medical need. Ms. Bailey. We might be getting into well beyond the scope of what we're doing here, but if we have non-physicians reviewing medical need, that's a violation of 62M, but um, we can deal with that later. I think right now we just have a lot of bureaucracy. I guess what I don't understand, Ms. Bailey, are there no other drugs that have a separated pharmacy and administration that you already deal with? Ms. Bailey? Mr. Chair, Senator Benson, no. There is no other drugs that we have a split um, claim on the pharmacy level and a split claim on the on the administration level. Senator Benson. Um, thank you. And there's no automatic way we're checking for double charges in case a patient goes to see one provider and then sees another provider for the same claim. Ms. Bailey. Um, Chair uh, Key, Senator Benson, I, uh, what's isolated in this fiscal note is the fact that we would have to identify um, what's isolated in this versus what happens under current law is that the administration and the pharmacy claims happen at different times through different claims. And so we would have to ensure that if we're paying the pharmacy claim that the person in fact did receive um, the drugs through the administration claim and that occurs on a different date and that administration claim does not also include the pharmacy amount. So Senator Benson. Mr. Chair, there should be a way to tell if the administration claim includes the pharmacy. That should be pretty straightforward because you'd have a code for the drug and the patient. I mean, it seems like the, the 0.5 FTE for the fiscal analyst that run the reports, that sounds obviously necessary for looking at deduplication. But then we just keep adding on and the fact that your Sears folks are doing medical reviews. Um, 
So, uh, Ms. Bailey, you and I can go offline as to what those Sears folks actually do, but if the department's gonna deny claims based on medical necessity, then you should be employing physicians. Um, so, I, I guess, Mr. Chair, I'd see, I look at two FTEs here that are um, doing duplicative work of the previous one FTE. And so, Mr. Chair, I think um, there's some evidence a similar bill passed in Colorado that two FTEs were sufficient. So maybe just for purposes of moving this bill forward, when this shows up on a spreadsheet somewhere, we give them two FTEs. Okay. Thank you, Senator Benson. Any other comments? Uh, Senator Cran. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Benson. Uh, we. I didn't have any additional questions. The duplicate question was, uh, or existing process. Uh, Senator Benson did a great job of covering them. And so with that, Mr. Chair, if there's no other um, questions or comments, I agree with Senator Benson when we move forward and we decide what, how we're gonna fund this. Um, I, I agree with that. And so, Mr. Chair, if you would allow me, I'd like to renew the, my motion to move Senate File 61 be recommended to pass as amended and be referred to the Finance Committee. Everyone understand the motion before us? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, S Senator Cran, you have Senate file 3580. If you would uh, like to move your bill to be bring it before us and then uh, uh, please introduce it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move Senate file 3580. Okay. Can you give me one second, Mr. Chair? Lost the document. And Mr. Chair, we also have an amendment. I believe it's the A1 amendment. This is the first stop author's amendment. So I'd like to move the A1 amendment to Senate file 3580. Senator Cran, I believe it's the A2. Oh. That's the latest amendment, oh. which would be the one you want to use. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the A2 amendment to Senate file 3580. Okay, members, this is an author's amendment. Everybody has a copy of the A2. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With that, um, Senate file 3580, is, uh, is, is we've, for many years we've been looking at um, how can the state build or, or provide better solutions to address dental access rates for Minnesotans being served on our public programs. Namely, how can the state get more Minnesotans to see a dentist at least once a year and how can we encourage more dentists uh, to see more patients? Last year, the legislature, we took a pretty big step uh, and positive step forward in, in significantly increasing the reimbursement rates for dentists who treat adults and children under, enrolled under medical assistance. The hope being that the dentists would be incentivized to see more of, the, more of these Minnesotans annually. As a part of the bill, we also passed uh, last year, DHS was instructed to create and report every March um, to analyze the impacts and the rate increase on dental access. What this bill does, it's designed to increase the amount of data collected for these reports so we can have a fuller picture of the impacts on the rate increase. Currently, DHS is to report on dental utilization by enrollees in the PMAP and the FFS programs. Senate 3580 will add the collection of data on, the, on a number of dentists treating enrollees in the programs in Minnesota, in, and in Minnesota care, and to see if the rate changes increase the number of dentists tre treating patients uh, statewide and, and geographically. Uh, the language has been shared with DHS and they've suggested a change, and that was the A2 amendment. And what that does is it helps uh, to make sure and protect uh, identities uh, by region and by district or congressional districts to have a, at least an understanding geographically where those dentists are located and to track the, those offering from those before the increase and those after. So um, the collection of this additional data just be part of the reports uh, starting next year for the re report due on March 15th, 2023. Mr. Chair, that's all the comments we have and I don't know that we have any testifiers. Okay. Thank you, Senator Coran. Um, Members, any questions for Senator Cran on this? Senator Klein. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. And Senator Cran, I was grateful to be a co-author on the bill. And this will be important data for this committee to review whether that increase in funding actually led to actual uptake in dental services for medical assistance patients. I'm still trying to fully understand the A2. Was the concern that the county or counties would be too granular data and you'd expose identities of individual dentists or something? Or? Mr. Chair, Senator Klein, yep. that's exactly it. Senator Klein, yes. yep. yep. That was exactly the reason. And thank you for signing on. And also thank you for signing on, Senator Drayheim, for to be co-authored. Co Senator Klein, that's exactly it. So when they looked at it, uh, based on the reports and the utilization, it could really point to very specific dentists. So um, they believe this language will get it more regionally and still be able to get us um, the data we need or to understand where the coverage is without specifically identifying individual providers. Thank you. Because, yeah, as an example, my home county, there's dentists only in one town. So it would be easy to identify in some of these small rural counties. And that isn't what we're after. We're after the grand total, you know, uh, scheme of the what this will report. So thanks. Any other further comments, questions? Seeing none, any final comments, uh, Senator no. Coran? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I have no further comments. I think it's a really good idea, a really good change to get not only who is being served, but where are they being served, and so we can get that picture from a statewide perspective on an ongoing basis. So with that, Mr. Chair, if there's no other comments, I'd move that Senate File 3580 be recommended to pass and as amended and sent to general orders. Thank you, Senator Crean. All members have heard the motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Senator Thank Crean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next up, we have Senate File 4025, Senator Rosen. Senator Rosen, and when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And let's Chair. see, here we need to uh, move. There is an amendment, Mr. One. Chair, to put the bill into necessary form, I believe. <clears throat> okay, um, but we need. Senator Drayheim, would you move uh, Senate File 4025 to be before us? So moved. Thank you. Okay. Senator Rosen, if Thank you would you, like Mr. to Chair. introduce your bill and when appropriately, I know you have an amendment. I, I do have the uh, A1 amendment uh, before you, Mr. Chair. And basically, um, this is from Ms. Kavanaugh. I believe it's just a technical amendment. Is that correct? Ms. Yeah, Mr. Chair and um, Senator Rosen, that this was suggested language from MMB, and it is just technical. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chair. Uh, this will be an off. Oh, Senator Klein, I move the A1. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, this would be an author's amendment. So, all those in favor of the A1 amendments, please please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Same sign. The amendment is adopted. <laughs> Senator Rosen, to I your miss bill. this committee, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Klein. So Senate File 4025 is the opioid settlement. And just to go back a little bit, on July 21st, 2021, a $26 billion offer to settle was made by the opioid manufacturer Johnson & jo Johnson and the big three distributors, McKesson, Amerisource Bergen, and Cardinal Health. Um, they were at 21 billion, Johnson & Johnson was at 5 billion, and that was to resolve their liabilities in over four, three, excuse me, 3,000 opioid-related lawsuits nationwide. In last November, McKinsey settled for nearly 600 million with 49 states over their role in opioid crisis and their sales advice to drug makers, including Purdue Pharma. So before we, I walk through um, Senate File 4025 members, I'd like to give, take it back to 2019 when we passed the House File 400, which was a landmark piece of legislation 
and it created licensing and registration fee increases on opioid manufacturers to fund the Opioid Epidemic Response Fund. The 2019 bill negotiated a 50-50 split of that money, 50% to counties and tribes for out-of-home placement costs due to drug-related abuse cases using data from previous calendar year. And then the remaining 50% went to ORAC, which is the Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council that was created. I'd like to thank Senator Eaton and Senator Cran for their work on that council and work in opioids and drugs all together. At the time, we knew of the lawsuits and the potential litigation, but uncertain of the mechanics of how those settlements were going to be coming in. The state is now projected to date to receive over $300 million. The state, 87 counties, and 140 Minnesota cities filed lawsuits filed lawsuits, and that money is going directly to, um, <laughs> I'm missing one of my pages of uh, testimony, Mr. Chair, <laughs> that's funny, is going directly to the counties and cities and not through DHS. And that was uh, a piece that was highly negotiated uh, with in the, in the agreement that uh, happened this late summer and the fall of four months of negotiation with the Attorney General's office the um, League of Minnesota Cities, the, um, the Council of Greater Minnesota Cities, and the Association of Minnesota Councils, or, or Counties, excuse me. So Senate File 4025 is necessary to reflect the technical changes required from the 2019 legislation in order to capture the settlement funds. And again, last summer, the state signed on to the National Opioid Epidemic Settlement and the, um, the AG office, as I said, carefully negotiated between the state and the local governments to reach a comprehensive agreement that all of the 87 counties and 140 cities uh, joined in this agreement. And then as part of that multi-state national settlement, the companies want current lawsuits resolved and want to prevent future lawsuits in order to guarantee Minnesota receives all entitled funds without delay. A statutory claims bar is needed to release any of these remaining claims and prevent future claims. So the AG's office works, worked closely with those three groups, and we do have someone here from the Association of Minnesota Counties for a 75% split and a 25%, a 75-25 split. 75% would go to the counties and cities directly, and 25% would be for state share, which would go directly to ORAC. The monies um, that DHS then is required to establish a new account along with the original registration and license fee account, which is called the settlement account. So we have the registration license account, which is from the 2019 bill, and now we have a new account, the settlement account. Revenue from that opioid registration fee and opioid license account uh, would go into, or, or fees would go into that registration account and then any monies received by the state resulting from a settlement agreement are deposited into the settlement account. The bill also specifies when the opiate registration and license fees are reduced. And uh, members, I'd like to apologize to a few of my members. I was uh, misspoke um, earlier last week about what happens if this bill does not pass. And I will let um, uh, Mr. Maloney from the Attorney General's office, or Assistant Attorney General, speak on that. But uh, there is a share that does come to the state. It's just a much lower share. So in 2019, 250 million was agreed upon in the settlement fund threshold, and that was highly, highly negotiated. The House wanted about a, a million, a billion dollars. We uh, then they wanted 750 million, and we negotiated it down to 250 million. And when that threshold is, was met. And we thought we would be getting a lump sum of money immediately. Um, now we know that it is being trickled out. Uh, then the license and registration fees would click off or go down to a lower level, I should say. But again, we had no idea it would come in one, if it would come in a one lump sum or a scheduled as we have. And Mr. Maloney will go through that spreadsheet also. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair and members, 
I would like to turn it over to Mr. Eric Maloney from the Assistant Attorney General Office. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Rosen. Uh, Mr. Good Maloney, thank you. Please proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Senator, and, and thank you, Chair, and uh, good afternoon to the Chair and, and, and members of the uh, committee. My name is Eric Maloney. Uh, so I'm one of the Assistant Attorneys General that was assigned to uh, start investigating and litigating opioid cases back in 2016. Uh, under former Attorney General Lori Swanson. So this has been going on for a long time. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. I want to give a special thank you to all the bill authors. Uh, Senator Rosen, who's been fantastic. Uh, I know Senators Eaton and Coran have also been great. So I wanted to thank you all uh, for your incredible work and, and leadership on this issue. It's a very important issue. So as Senator Rosen just laid out, um, you know, as of last summer, uh, the state of Minnesota and the AG's office uh, joined nationwide settlements uh, with four different companies. Uh, three opioid dis distributors, McKesson, Cardinal Health, Amerisource Bergen, and then one opioid maker named Johnson & Johnson. It's a, it's a familiar name to most, to most folks. Um, these settlements are the culmination of years-long multi-state investigations into these companies stemming from their actions that fuel the opioid crisis. In addition to prohibiting misconduct by the companies in the future, the settlements provide for potentially more than $300 million to the state of Minnesota. Now, these settlements are unique. They're resolving claims not only of states, so it's not just Minnesota, right? It's, this is a, a, a multi-state settlement, but also of thousands of participating cities and counties throughout the whole country. Um, the financial structures of the settlements are designed so that as more cities and counties join the settlements, more money is received by the state. Uh, this is meant to incentivize cities and counties to, to join and incentivize states to encourage cities and counties to, to, to join. Um, the settlements also have a unique structure that allows individual states to come up with their own agreements with local governments to determine how the funds should be allocated and spent within each state. So here in Minnesota, as, as Senator Rosen already laid out, our office brought together the Association of, of Minnesota Counties, so you'll, you'll, you'll hear from soon, uh, the League of Minnesota Cities, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, uh, many state agencies, including the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, MDH, DHS, MMB, uh, some legislative members, uh, state and local public health officials, and healthcare providers. Um, and we had months of meetings with all these various stakeholders that were facilitated by the state's Office of Collaboration and Dispute Resolution. And the outcome of these months of meetings with these many stakeholders was that we had in agreement on the page between the state and local governments, which did a number of things, but the, the kind of crux of it that I think you know, is important today is that it, was, it, it set up the 75-25 split between the state and cities and counties. So 75% goes directly to cities and counties, uh, and then 25% would go to the state to be overseen by ORAC, the uh, Opioid Council. The, Agreement also has a 13-page non-exclusive list of approved opioid abatement programs and strategies for which the state and cities and counties can dedicate funding. All 87 counties and more than 140 cities signed on to the state-local agreement and joined the settlements as of January 2022, which uh, for, for Minnesota was a big step toward maximizing the amount of settlement funds that, that we can receive. Senate File 4025 is the necessary next step to implement the state-local agreement. It consists of three main items. Uh, first, it unlocks settlement funds to allow cities, counties, and the state to put them to use right away to fight the opioid crisis. Second, it amends a state law to enable the agreed upon 75-25 state and lo local split. Uh, third, it, it puts in place a claims bar which ensures that Minnesota will receive maximum payments from the multi-state settlements. Um, I know that, that Senator Rosen had, had mentioned about the consequences of not passing this legislation, so um, I think just a few points to make on that. The kind of first impact is that we have delayed payments. Uh, if this law doesn't pass, we could receive payments as soon as, I think even next week, if, if, if things kind of went swimmingly. Um, if there's no legislation passed this session, we're, we, we have to wait until August. Um, so that's you know millions of dollars in payments that are going to sit in the bank account that could be uh, put to use uh, much much sooner. Um, there's also the issue of the state share being 
reduced or changed. There's a bit of complication to it, but the net result would basically be that instead of the state share being 25%, it would be about 20%. Um, because of how the current law works and how the math would, would, would work out, um, given how the agreement was set forth. So there are kind of more consequences too that you know, I won't get into, but those are kind of the, the two off the top of my head that you know, the immediate result of not having this, this legislation put in place. Um, so with that, that's all I had for my prepared remarks. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions that members may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Senator Rosen, you have Angela Teese. Welcome to the committee. Please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Senator Benson, uh, Chair Utke, and members of the committee. My name is Angie Teese. I am the Child Wellbeing Policy Analyst for the Association of Minnesota Counties. I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 4025. And as Senator Rosen and Assistant Attorney General Eric Maloney have stated, um, this is a tremendous opportunity to recognize the local impact that substance use disorder and, opi and the opioid epidemic um, really has hit counties pretty dramatically. And so um, we participated over about 120 days beginning, I think, as of August 1st, um, culminating right around the holiday season in December in negotiations around um, what these terms might look like, how these dollars may be utilized, um, the, the split between counties and tribes and cities. And that culminated again in a memorandum of agreement. All 87 counties did sign off on that memorandum of, of agreement and entered into the national settlement. We are very proud of that and worked very closely with the Attorney General's office to accomplish that. Um, as Assistant Attorney General um, Eric Maloney indicated, the two provisions that, that we'd like to indicate support for is we really need to pass this legislation so that it splits the funds um, into those two accounts and releases those funds uh, as early as April, if possible, so that, again, local governments may begin utilizing those funds to address the opioid epidemic. And then the second provision... I have my notes. <laughs> I found my notes. I ordered. <laughs> And uh, the second provision is that it allows um, these dollars to uh, it allows these dollars to be put to work expeditiously, and uh, it releases the funds um, very quickly. So, with that, um, I am happy to. I think that closes my testimony. And again, thank you, members, uh, Senator Eaton. As Senator Cran, the original authors of House File 400 and the ORAC Commission, uh, for your tremendous leadership on this issue. Thank you, uh, Senator Rosen. Think anything further? Otherwise, we'll go to questions. From yes, members. thank you, Madam Chair. I did want to direct uh, to our Assistant Attorney General uh, Maloney the the there is a, a timeline of when these funds do come in, and you can step through that. And so it does succinct with the change of the uh, of the bill on uh, page 9, line 13. And the registration fee is moved out from 2024 to 2031. I just want to draw everybody's attention to that, and we can have that discussion about the consequences to that, but also um, how this is succinct with when these payments are coming in, the settlement payments. Thank you. Questions from members? OK. Um, and I would just like to ask Mr. Maloney, could you explain to us what happens to this money if the language isn't passed? Yes, uh, Chair and Senator Benson. Um, so there's a few things. So I walked you through two of them. So I guess I can even, I can go kind of deeper on a, and, a few of these points. Um, Mr. Maloney, I don't think we need more detail. We just need specifically what happens to this money if this language isn't passed. Sure, uh, thank you, uh, Chair and Senator Benson. Uh, so the settlement funds are delayed. So there is the agreement between the state and local governments was set up that um, it anticipates legislation being passed. So without that, we have to wait until August to have the payments come in when they could be coming in next month. Um, there is a um, potential reduction and a uh, possible, you know, kind of slowdown in the payments in the future. Um, without this, this legislation and the claims bar, 
um, we can ensure that Minnesota earns the kind of maximum money from the settlement's financial structure. Um, so both kind of like our, our top end of what Minnesota could earn is going to be lower. It may be millions lower. Um, it, it may also lead to reduced payments or delayed payments in the future if we have a lawsuit from a city or county. It wouldn't be a county, but it would be any, any city that hasn't signed on yet could sue in the future. And that kind of puts a crimp on, on Minnesota's payments. Um, it would also, as I said in my uh, initial testimony, it would result in a lower share to ORAC and to the, the state. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Senator Eaton. Thank you. Um, isn't it true, Mr. Malloy, that um, if we don't pass this bill, that we'll only be able to um, spend $20 million a year of the settlement and that the counties would have to um, write grants to get any share of that $20 million a year? Mr. Maloney. Thank you, Chair, and uh, Senator Eaton. You are exactly right. And that is, uh, we, we at the AG's office have called this the, uh, the uh, lockbox has been our term for it. But how the state law is currently set up, the settlement funds that have been received by the state, and this is true, we have, we have one settlement that's been funded so far. Um, they have basically, they haven't gone into the opioid fund, right? They have gone into a separate account. Um, and under current law, they are basically kept in this fund until uh, 2024 at the very earliest. So they are definitely stuck there until 2024. And then they aren't released in the $20 million per year until we've received $250 million in both fees and settlement dollars to trigger the sunset of the Board of Pharmacy fees. Um, so that is a, a crucial piece of this legislation, is trying to get those funds moved from the separate account from this lockbox and have them put into the opioid fund to be put to use right away. Further questions? All right. Um, seeing none, um, Senator Eaton moves that Senate File 4025 as amended be recommended to pass and sent to the Committee on Civil Law and Data Practices. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you, Senator Eaton. Next on our agenda, Senator Duckworth is available. Thank you, oh, Madam Chair. Senator thank you. Duckworth, thank you. Um, let's see. Looking for co-authors. Um, Senator Klein moves Senate File 2678 to be before us. Welcome to the committee, Senator Duckworth. Please begin your presentation. Thanks very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to present Senate File 2678. I apologize for not being there in person. Uh, if passed, this bill would provide patients across Minnesota with other options to access injectable medication administration services and monitoring device placement administration services. This bill would allow pharmacists to administer patients prescribed injectable medications through subcutaneous or intramuscular routes and allow pharmacists to place extra, uh, excuse me, external drug monitoring devices on patients. 33 other states allow pharmacists to perform such injections for patients, including all the states that border Minnesota. Many patients appreciate assistance in placing monitoring devices for diabetes and other conditions. It's a good common sense bill that uh, can help a lot of people. And uh, Madam Chair, I do have a testifier who can share some more information regarding this bill as well. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Duckworth, do you want to introduce your text testifier? Absolutely. Uh, I have uh, with me today Sarah Durr, and I'll allow her to uh, share her credentials and which organization she's a part of. Thank you. Ms. Durr, welcome to the committee. Please proceed. Sarah, Senator. Chair, Senator Benson, and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Sarah Durr. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, would we be able to switch over to Sarah Durr? Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Hi, Sarah. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, OK. OK. Thank you, Ms. Durr. <laughs> I'll proceed. Chair, Senator Benson, members of the committee, my name is Dr. Sarah Durr. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Pharmacy Association and here testifying today on behalf of all of Minnesota Pharmacy and Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance. I want to thank you for hearing SF 2678, 
legislation that will allow pharmacists to work with patients to administer prescribed medications through subcutaneous and intermuscular injection and assist patients in placing external monitoring devices. Pharmacists have been administering subcutaneous and intramuscular immunizations for 20 years. Pharmacists are trained to provide medication administration via injection in the current doctor of pharmacy programs across the country. I was trained in these techniques in pharmacy school at the University of Minnesota and had the opportunity um, in pharmacy school to administer vaccines at a free clinic in Minneapolis. As Senator Duckworth noted, all states bordering Minnesota and Canada, pharmacists are able to provide medication administration for any prescribed medication. Currently, 33 states allow pharmacists to administer prescribed medications. Allowing pharmacists to provide these services will reduce disparities for a significant subset of the population who are unable to engage in convenient care or avoid primary care for a variety of reasons, including fear, shame, and stigma. A couple of examples of how pharmacists can assist patients. My dad had, has had two heart attacks in the last two years and was prescribed Lovenox, an injectable blood thinner. He was not comfortable doing this at home by himself and had to make an appointment with, with a clinic to get this administered and learn how to do this. It would have been much more convenient for him if he could learn how to do this from a pharmacist upon picking up his medication. I'm sure you also all know someone with diabetes who needs to inject insulin or other medications or someone who is on fertility medications that require injections. This bill would allow pharmacists to assist with injecting these medications. Assisting with adherence is key, and this would also assist with monitoring for any adverse effects or other concerns that patients may have. This bill also allows for the placement of drug monitoring devices according to a protocol or collaborative practice agreement. As technology becomes available for patients to utilize, pharmacies are a great access point for monitoring device placement. One example is placing a continuous glucose monitor for a patient with diabetes. Pharmacists are already doing this in the clinic setting. Please support this bill to increase patient access and help patients feel more comfortable administering their medications. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about SF2678. We also provided supporting information in members' packets uh, for both, uh, both of the bills that Senator Duckworth is ha having you here today. Further questions from members? Seeing none, uh, Senator Klein renews his motion that Senate File 2678 be recommended to pass and placed on general orders. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Senator Duckworth, Senate File 2678 is on its way. Senator Duckworth, you have Senate File 3940. And yes, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. I do have a, an A3 amendment regarding the next bill as well. Okay, I'll move. Uh, actually, Senator Drayheim moves uh, Senate File 3940 to be before us. And this is first stop, so we'll treat the A3 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor of the A3, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Thank you. Senator Duckworth, please, please proceed with your description of your bill. Well, thank you again, Madam Chair and members. Um, if passed, this bill, as amended, as amended, would codify in Minnesota statute some federal authorities granted to pharmacists, pharmacy interns, and pharmacy technicians under the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act. Uh, the A3 amendment was a means of achieving stakeholder consensus. It removes age modifications regarding pharmacy immunization. It also uh, maintains that a pharmacist or pharmacy technician would be providing these services under a collaborative practice agreement with a provider. Uh, the bill as amended would allow pharmacy technicians in Minnesota to help um, pharmacies and their patients with immunization workloads. It's essential uh, regarding flu shots, COVID-19 immunizations and others, as well as boosters to ensure they're readily available to patients throughout the state at their local community pharmacy uh, when vaccines are needed. The other language that remains in the bill would make changes to Minnesota 151.01 to allow pharmacists to order FDA approved CLIA waived health tests that pharmacists already have authority to and are providing patients under Minnesota law. Uh, it's, uh, this bill reflects uh, some really good lessons learned over the last two years. And Madam Chair, I do have a testifier who can share more information regarding this bill as well. Um, her name is Michelle, and I, I apologize if I get her last name wrong. I believe it's uh, Ite. Ite. Ms. Ite. 
Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Okay. Um, good afternoon and thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to testify in support of Senator Duckworth's Senate Bill 3940 as amended. Um, as Senator Duckworth mentioned, my name is Michelle Ate. You were close. Um, I'm a Walgreens pharmacist, uh, Minnesota Pharmacy Association past president and current co-chair of the Minnesota Pharmacy Alliance. In addition, I'm an American Pharmacy Association immunization trainer. Um, in that capacity and since the pandemic began in 2020, I've personally trained over 1,000 pharmacy technicians that are now certified to help pharmacists and pharmacies with immunizations, and in particularly COVID-19 immunizations across our state. Being a trainer has afforded me the opportunity to tell you that technicians that have undergone this immunization training are more than qualified to perform this activity safely. Technicians are required to be properly trained prior to immunizing, and the act of administering a vaccine does not require professional judgment. We all know the pressure that healthcare professionals and pharmacists are under today in our current setting. Every vaccine given by a pharmacy technician alleviates pressure from pharmacists and others and permits us to have more face-to-face -face time and clinical opportunities with our patients. Two years ago, the federal government under the HHS Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness PrEP Act authorized technicians that have been trained and certified to administer immunizations. Since then, pharmacies in Minnesota have provided 3.5 million COVID-19 vaccinations to Minnesotans. We estimate that over 35% of these shots that were administered were given by trained pharmacy technicians including the shots received by myself and my family. More and more states are continuing to progress down the path of permanently expanding technician roles when it comes to immunizations. It's clear that the role of the technicians to support pharmacists is critical to the success of pharmacy being a solution to our healthcare crisis. As Senator Duckworth mentioned, stakeholders from Minnesota um, across healthcare systems, including the Board of Pharmacy, MMA, APRNs, NMPs, have all worked together and agreed on the amended language. The A3 before you is the consensus language that all parties have agreed upon and will ensure that critical services can continue to be provided after the pandemic ends and the PREP Act declarations expire. Pharmacies and pharmacy technicians continue to provide critical health services to Minnesotans every day. We're seeking to continue to be able to provide these services long after this pandemic is over. Patients, providers, and patient access will benefit by enacting these changes to this Minnesota law. We urge you to pass Senate File 3940 today and enact the amended version of Senate File 3940. I want to thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and at this time I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, um, Ms. Ate. Questions from members? Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And um, I just that how things mature in this world, I carried legislation. I don't remember when it was. Still, let pharmacists uh, work at the more top of their license. And so i um, generally happy about this. But I do have a question, I suppose, for the testifier. Um, so those criteria on page 210 to 219, um, are those included in something as a national protocol uh, entirely? For instance, uh, name and dose and each vaccine, patient population, contraindications, are those included by reference somewhere in this list or are they deleted? M Ms. Ate? Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Abler. Um, I don't have that exact, can you refer to what number you said again, Senator Abler? Well, on page Senator two uh, lines, oh, thanks, Madam Chair. On page two lines, 10 to 19 or so, there's a bunch of things that you're supposed to keep track of and okay. tell people. Yeah, um, what we're currently um, proposing is currently um, not only in the HHS prep language that was passed, um, that's also in the, the bill language that we presented, and it does include um, training for these pharmacy technicians that's been approved or a board approved program, includes CPR, um, includes two hours of continuing education, includes that these technicians are supervised by a pharmacist um, in their training and when providing these services, and also that it's under a direct um, collaborative practice agreement with the provider. So each pharmacy on file would have a copy of that 
CPA, um, Senator Abler, I believe that's what you're asking, and all of those, um, the requirements of a collaborative practice agreement, and those requirements would be included in that collaborative practice agreement. Right, um, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. That's a, maybe you didn't understand my question. That's a very nice answer. <laughs> I tried. Sorry. So I, I'm not worried about the credential of the person. I'm just worried about what they're going to talk about. Yeah. So me, I'll be more specific. Okay. On page, uh, line 213, it says contraindications and precautions that they're supposed to tell the person. They're supposed to keep track of the name, dose, and route of each vaccine, patient, pot, and, and uh, so the name of the people that are there. You do that at your current, that's the bill I, we passed way back when. So uh, I'll just be specific. On line 213, you're striking that they have to tell them about contraindications and precautions. Is that included in one of the protocols somewhere else, or are you just not going to tell them that anymore? That's my Ms. question. Ate. Madam Chair and Senator Abler, I'm, I'm sorry, I, don't, I do not have that in front of me. I'd be happy to follow up and get that information to you. All right. Well, I, I can give you a clue. Um, and I admit, it's just a, it's your bill, it's not mine. But on 2.28, they have to comply with the guidelines established by some advisory committee. Um, but just, I'm just one that I'm, I just think people should know the goods and the bads. And, yeah. yes. and in the past, this was part of what you had to do. So uh, I'm, if it's not Senator, there, I'm concerned. So thanks. Yes. Senator Abler, we do have Cody Weiberg at the Board of Pharmacy who might be able to fill us in on okay. the language and the question. Uh, Mr. Weiberg. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, my name is Cody Weiberg. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Board of Pharmacy and I'll give you a little bit of background on this. Uh, Pharmacists have been able to uh, enter into protocols with practitioners for quite some time. This is the only place in statute where the actual requirements that have to be in that protocol are specified. This was something that was worked out the last time. Uh, the uh, pharmacy community, if you will, sought to have their ability to immunize expanded. Uh, and it, it doesn't mean that uh, these items would not be in a protocol. The pharmacy would and pharmacists would still need a protocol with a practitioner. And uh, it just, there's no longer this requirement in statute if this passes that all the details are spelled out in statute. Uh, but the Board of Pharmacy does expect that protocols are sufficient, if you will, to, to meet what the pharmacist and the practitioner are doing together. So that's really what this is. And it, it doesn't mean that the pharmacist would not be explaining these things. Uh, it just means that there would not be this requirement in law, which is unique for vaccinations. We don't have this level of specification for any other sort of protocol that pharmacists can enter into. Senator Abler. Madam Chair, I'm not going to belabor it, but, um, you know, and I'm not trying to even, <laughs> Senator Klein, I'm not trying to go there, um, but <laughs> we could, but I just, I, I'm uncomfortable that it might be discussed, and so uh, I just know too many people that were, had, that were fine and then suddenly found themselves extremely not fine, not knowing that that was even a possibility. It just seems that from some vaccine, um, and I wish I didn't know anybody like that. But I just, I think it should be spelled out the way it is. I don't see any protection there, and so I'm concerned, and so I'm sure I don't support the bill. Thank you. So, um, and if that could be worked out, I'd be happy to work with the author and find a way to clarify it. Thank and you. And Senator Abler, we did adopt the A3, you were here, so. The delete all, Madam Chair? Yes. Okay, thank I'm, you. I'm talking about that, thank you. Um, so, um, Ms. Ate, I do have a question. Um, I'm unfamiliar with the training of a pharmacy intern. Um, Madam Chair, uh, thank you for the question. I, I, I kind of smiled there because I have my pharmacy resident here in the audience and I, I wouldn't make him come up and testify on the spot. But uh, the pharmacy interns these days um, and the students coming out of pharmacy school already have received all of this training. The same training that I would as a pharmacist, which includes um, 20 hours of um, educational training and um, in addition to the required CE that we keep up, our CPR, our bloodborne pathogens, um, emergency response 
response so that we are trained to know, as um, Senator Abler was concerned, if an emergency reaction were to occur, we are trained on how to respond in those situations and well. And the great thing about it is um, when I graduated uh, back in a long time ago, uh, we weren't trained in these services and that's why I became a pharmacy immunization trainer so that I could train those that graduated and I did. But all the students coming out today are, are trained and ready to go and excited to provide these services for our patients. Thank you, Ms. A. Tay. Questions from other members? Seeing no further questions or comments, uh, Senator Duckworth, closing comments. Uh, no, Madam Chair, other than to say thank you very much for the consideration. I uh, appreciate the input, feedback, and questions from members. Uh, and we'll certainly uh, continue to take that into consideration as we move forward. I appreciate it. And members, the motion will be to finance because there's a chance this has a fiscal note. Um, is someone from the Department of Human Services available? It's my understanding there's some concern about cost. And I'm watching for hands. Um, Ms. Ashby. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, the, the department just needs to look into okay. whether there are any provider enrollment impacts for this bill. Okay. Thank you. And with that, members, <clears throat> um, Senator Dreheim renews his motion that Senate File 3940 as amended be recommended to pass and sent to the Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Regretfully no, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, Senate File 3940 is on its way to finance. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Next on our agenda today is Senator Howe. Senate File 3201. And looking for a co-author. This one is a Senator Klein co-author. Senator Klein, um, I'm the motion will be to general orders when the time comes. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senate File 3201 deals with the J-1 waiver process that we have with uh, our folks to the north and the Canadian uh, doctors. And so what I'd like to do, Madam Chair, is, is go to uh, maybe pass the A-2 amendment. Okay, this is your first stop, so we'll treat it as an author's amendment. Senator Klein moves the A2 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Senator Howe, please proceed with your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and what this essentially does with the A2 amendment is allows uh, someone, currently right now, w once you've spent seven years practicing here, if you're a Canadian doctor, uh, you've got to either uh, have a waiver or basically in order to be actually eligible for the waiver you got to go back to Canada for two years uh, and then uh, apply for your waiver so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense he, he would uh, you know you've got to pass the United States medical licensing examination and what this amendment would allow is is that if you're Credentials are recognized by the Minnesota Board of Examiner, Medical Examiners for issuance of a state medical license. If, you're, if you have a state medical, Minnesota state medical license, uh, it should probably uh, meet those, uh, those other requirements. So anyway, I'm not an expert on this thing. I, will, uh, I think we should go to the testifiers and let them uh, explain this because uh, when you're dealing with the medical folks and then the immigration, it gets pretty, uh, pretty complicated. Thank you. We have uh, Dr. Kyle Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin? Yes, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Um, yes, I can. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Um, so my name is Kyle Martin, Dr. Kyle Martin. I'm an orthopedic surgeon currently working in central Minnesota. And um, I'm actually from not that far away, uh, born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba. 
And so that's where I did all of my training uh, initially. So I did my undergraduate medical school and residency there in orthopedic surgery. After there, I went over and worked in Norway for a year and followed that up with a year at Mayo Clinic. And to go to Mayo Clinic, I did obtain a J visa. And after the time at Mayo Clinic, I obtained an H-1B visa to work in central Minnesota, and that's where I am now. So as some background, uh, there are two ways to obtain an H-1B visa to work as a physician. Uh, the most common is to complete the three steps of the United States Medical Licensing Exam, or the USMLE, while the second is to obtain an exemption to that USMLE requirement. So as a Canadian, I did not take the USMLE's examination. And so I applied for and was granted an H-1B exemption based on the work that I've done and continued to do. So the H-1B exemption granted by the United States Customs and Immigration is for a physician who is recognized to be of international or national renown. So based on that, I'm currently working in central Minnesota on my H-1B, and I also do hold a full Minnesota medical license, but I'm currently not eligible for permanent residency because of my previous J visa status. So this will remain until I either leave the United States for two years or obtain a J visa waiver through the Conrad waiver program. So the federal Conrad waiver program allows physicians to waive the two year home country return requirement if working in a medically underserved area or treating patients from medically underserved areas. And the state decides who can apply for the waiver. In Minnesota, it's currently a requirement to have the US MLE completed to be considered for the Conrad program and that's not a federal requirement. So given my situation, our proposal would be to allow physicians such as myself with a full license to practice medicine in Minnesota to be eligible for the waiver recommendation in place of the USMLE requirement. I do recognize it's a somewhat complicated situation. I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions from members. Uh, Dr. Klein, Senator Klein. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, this stuff is confusing, Madam Chair and Senator Howell, even if you're a little closer to it as I am. But uh, uh, I think it's a good bill, and I, I respect the intent, actually. I, I want to achieve the outcome for, in particular, Dr. Martin that he's seeking. With the amendment, and I don't know if the author can answer this or possibly Ms. Cavanaugh, if there's somebody from the medical board, um, would that then expand the scope of this bill to cover not just Canadian physicians, but maybe physicians on, on visas from other countries as well? Uh, Senator Howe? Well, I don't believe that uh, if it, the way it was explained to me, I do not believe that we have this agreement with doctors from other, other countries. I think that this is specifically this arrangement with the J-1 visa program is with Canadian uh, with the Canadian medical community, but I'm not, Senator, not an expert. Senator Howe, Dr. Martin. Uh, is available. He raised his hand and can answer. So, Dr. Martin, if you would unmute and explain Thank you, to Madam us. Chair. Yeah, so uh, I've, I've learned a lot about immigration law and medical practice over this whole process, but uh, right now it's, um, it's only eligible for Canadians because actually it's a federal requirement that you hold an H-1B, and so the only way to get an H-1B is to either leave for two years or be a Canadian. Um, in this case, and with the USMLEs as being the other other way to do that. So um, it really only applies to Canadians. And for the purpose of the medical license, I'm eligible for a full license because the Canadian exams and Canadian training was deemed um, equivalent to the US by the Department of Health. And Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And just to add a little bit more uh, to this discussion, uh, I, I do also uh, want to support the bill, and I want to thank uh, Senator Howe. Uh, the A1 amendment is an amendment that I worked with um, with the uh, supporters of the bill to do exactly what you uh, questioned, uh, Senator Klein, to make sure that it was not overly broad and that it actually uh, makes sure that um, there is that medical education that is accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. And I believe at this time, it is just the Canadian uh, piece. So the amendment mm -hmm. was an, an intention to make sure that the amendment was not overly broad. And Senator Klein, and then we'll go to Senator Abler. And Madam Chair, thank you. And I guess in response to Dr. Martin's reply, you know, I understand that you can only get an H-1B visa 
if you're a Canadian citizen, but this amendment, we're specifically el eliminating the language surrounding H-1B visas. So, uh, and none of us here, it sounds like, are immigration experts, but we're all trying to play one on TV. But if there was somebody from uh, the, the Board of Medical Practice at some point who could give us an answer, I'm going to support the bill today, let's move it forward. Um, but it might be something just to make sure we're accomplishing exactly what we think we're accomplishing with this bill at some point. So. We do have, I understand, MDH staff available, but I don't see anyone from the Board of Medical Practice. Is, is there not a, Madam Chair, is there not a uh, immigration attorney available? And we do have Ms. Deborah Schneider, uh, attorney, immigration attorney available. Ms. Schneider, please introduce yourself for the record. And Hi, proceed. hello, this is Deborah Schneider. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm here really just as an outside uh, immigration attorney to confirm um, that the requirement for obtaining a medical license has not changed. Um, and it's very clear in, in the state legislature already for uh, requirements is to have passed from an accredited medical school or the Canadian equivalent. So it is limited for who would even qualify for a state license in Minnesota. And so therefore, this really only opens it up to those who either have passed the USMLEs or have already obtained approval from the state to practice medicine. Any further clarification? Senator Klein. Madam Chair, that's an excellent answer. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Abler. Well, thanks. I'm just learning about this bill, and it seems like a, I mean, it seems fine to me, but uh, there's some other foreign trained uh, graduates from across the world, many of whom are also august in their skills, 20 year surgeons and whatever. Um, this does nothing to help them. Is that right? whoever would know the answer to that question. Um, Senator Abler, um, no, it doesn't, because they didn't graduate from an accredited medical school, and so it has to be of. a school that the state of Minnesota recognizes as having been accredited. Oh. So a Canadian school, yeah. a U.S. school, so it does not. Just I'm trying to, there's a, there's a couple Senator hundred run around, Madam Chair, and they're uh, working as uh, I know. You know, bus persons and all that. So anyway, thank you. Uh, thank thank you, you, Senator Abler. Anything further to Senate File 3201? Seeing nothing further, Senator Klein renews his motion that Senate File 3201, as amended, be recommended to pass and placed on general orders. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Senator Howe? Let's give Senator Utke back his gavel. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. Okay, members, next up we have Senate File 1919 with Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move Senate File 1919. Okay, Senator Nelson brings, moves her bill before us, and do you want to uh, uh, move your amendment right away or do you want to introduce your bill first? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move the author's amendment, the A2, right away with my bill just to get it in the shape intended. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator Nelson. Members, we have the author's amendment before us, the A2. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. <laughs> Senator Nelson, to your bill as amended. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I start, I do want to thank uh, the co-sponsors, uh, Senator Dreheim, Senator Coran, Senator Duckworth, and Senator Lang. So uh, thank you all uh, for supporting this. Um, just a brief high... Um, kind of set the stage. Uh, we know that uh, businesses, uh, entrepreneurs all across our state are proactively exploring more ways to have renewable energy generation options in their commitment to sustainability. So that is, uh, innovations are allowing us to have renewable energy, sustainable energy, and this bill is just keeping up with uh, current current innovations. Uh, this bill establishes a new definition for a submerged closed loop heat exchanger. And modifying this definition will allow for solutions that do deliver more sustainable, energy efficient heating and cooling systems available both for commercial and 
residential applications. And of course, at the same time, we are insistent that we continue to protect our natural resources that are so important to us here in Minnesota. Uh, this bill is specifically looking at the innovation of geothermal, which has been around for quite some time in, in um, heating and cooling efficiencies using underground, uh, uh, underground temperatures. However, more recently, we've been able to achieve those same results in a much smaller footprint, and that's what this bill uh, seeks to do. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, before I call my testifiers to give you more details, I do want members to know, I know you all uh, read each bill very carefully, and I want you to know that the A2 amendment um, is most, it's on the second page. The first page of the amendment, simple, of the A2, simply is taking what was current language in 17A and moving it down to 17B. So when you see it struck, you'll know that language is reinserted in 17B. And 17A includes the language for the new uh, innovative geothermal closed loop that we will be speaking of today. So I just wanted to clarify that for members as we move forward. And, and with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn over to my first testifier, uh, Bruce Clavin. Sorry about that. Mr. Clavin, were you actually going to go first? I had just yeah. gotten a message that you were going to go second. It's, it's up to you guys. Do you want to go first? Oh. Yeah. Uh, well, well, we'll start with uh, U of M. Excuse me. Then Welcome we'll to our committee. Yeah. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. And I'm sorry to confuse you guys, but that's just the latest yeah. word I got that you were going to do it this way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, make friends with that microphone right. so that we'll we do. can hear well, you real I'll well. I'll lean in. I'll, I'll lean in. All right, uh, my name is Rick Hipsch. I'm the Executive Director of Technology Commercialization at the University of Minnesota. And uh, we, we all know the University of Minnesota is um, a strong uh, supplier of research technology and, and students to the state of Minnesota. Our role within the university is to take those innovations uh, that our researchers come up with and determine how we can transfer them uh, to have a, a larger impact on the state of Minnesota and beyond. Um, at the university, uh, some portion of that research does result in invention. Uh, we protect many of those inventions and we put them in the hands of corporations or startup companies uh, to, to have that impact. The university is great at research. Uh, the private industry and, and our, our, our large corporations and startups are good at making those into products. Some of those products um, are very disruptive. And those disruptive products um, oftentimes have technologies that haven't been thought of before and require um, changes in, in, our, um, in our ecosystem, whether it's in our investment ecosystem or in our uh, oftentimes legislative ecosystem. Um, over the past 15 years, the university has done lots of licensing of these technologies about 200 of those technologies have gone out through the route of a startup company. And, and again, these startup companies require the support of investors, they require the support of venture capital, they require um, the support of, of the legislation. Um, about 70% of those University of Minnesota startups, of those 200 startups are still alive, about 70% of the university startups are in the state of Minnesota and having a large impact with hundreds of, of employees and millions, uh, up to a billion dollars of other types of investments made in these companies. So again, the University of Minnesota's um, uh, technologies, and, and uh, in particular technologies in the areas uh, being discussed today, are, are very um, groundbreaking, very uh, t technology intensive, and, and do require uh, changes in, in the way that we, we think about these technologies. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next, uh, Mr. Clevin, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Bruce Clavin, I represent a company called Darcy Solutions on this issue. And I want to thank uh, Senator Nelson for picking up the file and carrying it. Uh, also to you, Mr. Chair, for hearing us before the second deadline, and to Ms. Strand and Ms. Kavanaugh for their help on the language. We retooled our presentation from four members, four people down to two, so that's where some of the confusion was from, Mr. Chair. So uh, I also have with me uh, Brian Larson and Alex Martell with the company for technical questions for you. But I'm going to walk you through the, the bill here in just a minute, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, the long and the short of what we have here today is a, a new geothermal technology that uses the convective flow of groundwater as the source of heating and cooling. You may have in your packet this picture, and you'll see on the picture uh, four, uh, several red tubes, that's your traditional in the earth geosystem. The one we're talking about is the larger blue one that stops at the groundwater. Oh, black and white, okay, black and white. It would be the one on the, the blue set to the right shows the tube that has the transfer fluid in it and it stops at the groundwater and the key to this system is using the convective flow as the groundwater passes by there it heats or cools the water in the tube depending upon whether you're using it in the winter or the summer so that's that's in a very very nutshell what we're talking about in this legislation the uh, company i should let you know members uh, we're talking the university representative talked about the investment from other parts we have, and I want the members to be uh, informed of this, State of Minnesota has issued an angel investor tax credits to the company to develop this in the amount of 480000 Department of Commerce has invested 300000 Department of Economic Development, 90. The federal grants between the USDA and the Department of Energy are about $2.6 So there's a lot of investment, a lot of interest in getting this off the ground. The reason we're here today in front of the Department or the Health Committee is because these systems would potentially be regulated by the Department of Health. And what we have here is sort of a new fruit, if you will. There's, there's rules for water well installation and there's rules for geothermals. This is a combination of those two and we don't have clear rules either to abide by or for the Department of Health to administer. And so we came up with some legislation. We took a crack at this last year Senator Dreheim carried the bill last year for us. And we didn't get very far because of a fiscal note last year. It was $1.1 million for this project. The department wanted six and a half FTEs last year for this, to oversee this new technology. That's more than the amount of people in the company. And so we got fiscal noted out last year. Uh, that was the long and the short of it. So we took another run this year. Senator Nelson picked up the file. And what we have before you is this DE2. I'll just walk you through it here quickly, members. Uh, Senator Nelson covered page one, that it's a lot more complicated than it looks. Uh, because of the alphabetizing, Ms. Kavanaugh had to move uh, what was the old 17A down to a new 17B. So what we're proposing on our definition, lines 1.6, calling it a submerged closed loop peak exchanger. It's a system that is, has four characteristics. Number one, it's installed in a water supply well, as your diagram shows. Number two, it uses the convective flow of groundwater as the primary medium of heat exchange. And number three, and this is very important, and this has actually become a source of contention, it contains potable water as the heat transfer fluid. Now, when we drew this bill up last year, you might remember the revisor was backed up seven or eight weeks. And so that was our first effort, and we referenced the current geothermal fluids, that glycol and anti-corrosive agents and things like that. And the department was concerned that putting those things in the tube and putting it in the groundwater was a potential leak source. So we changed the fluid in our bill to potable water. What is that? It's the stuff that comes out of your tap that you drink. The department is concerned that that is now going to be a source of contamination if it's put in the tube and put in the well. But potable water is a key point I want to emphasize to the members. And last, it uses the non-consumptive reconcirculation. It never leaves the tube and the system does not draw water out of the well. It just recirculates in there and transfers the temperature. You can see the rest of it there, the pumps and heat exchangers and the appurtenances are also part of the definition. When we turn to page two of the bill, of the DE, you'll see a new, a new insertion on line 2.9. Uh, as I mentioned, there are rules for water supply wells, and you'll see the uses for them there. Senator Nelson pointed out, this is new. We don't fit squarely in here, and so we're proposing to put our new definition as an authorized use of a water supply well. That's all that happens on line 2.9, but it's necessary in order to allow this to go forward. Then the final section is some of the installation language. This is all new coding for this, this new fruit, if you will. Number one, uh, expressly authorizing the commissioner. Uh, we borrowed that concept from another section, 103I.221, using plastic casings. And that language says the use of plastic casings is expressly authorized. And so we're just trying to let the commissioner know that they have some, some assurance that, from the legislature that these things are authorized to be used. And that's what we're trying to get at there. 
project may consist of more than one on a particular site. In your diagram, you'll see a building there. If that's a school or something large, the footprint, you can put several of these underneath there to use as heating and cooling. So that's why we say you can use more than one on the site. Setbacks. This has gotten to be another issue, point of contention, the setbacks here. There are setbacks of various kinds in the code, depending upon what's being used for. A typical one to think of is 35 feet for a water supply well. If you're out on a farm or something, and you're going to use the water and draw it out of the well, there's a 35-foot setback. If you're going to use the water, which we're not, we're putting the tube in there and recirculating it, the current geothermal rules provide a 15-foot setback. And that's the stuff in the tube that's the glycol and the anti-corrosive agents. Even that's only 15 feet. And so because we're using tap water, and we're using it uh, to not take it out of the ground, we propose 10 feet as a setback. And there's some consternation. League of Minnesota Cities in the department are concerned about that. But that's the explanation, the logic behind our language there. The construction, uh, the long and the short of this paragraph, I'm not a driller or an expert, but this has to do with the construction, so long as the configuration does not interconnect aquifers. And that's also part of the code, as I understand, so we spell that out, that we can, they can use various things as long as they don't interconnect. The last two have to do with the methodology that we run in the last two years with the department. Permits. Uh, we are proposing to say that, per that a permit is not required. Why would we say that here? The well, when it's drilled, has to be drilled to code by an authorized and licensed well driller. They have to follow the code, but they don't get a permit for that. They have to notify the department if they drill a well. If you do a geothermal system, a traditional one, you have to get a permit. And our thinking here is that since you're using the well with potable water that's not, we don't think, very not a source of contamination, it's tap water, that there would be no need for a permit because what would you be permitting? It wasn't an effort to get around anything. It was, it was to try to use the existing well notification process. And then last, variances. This, again, is maybe a little source of, con of consternation. Variance is not required. The reason we're proposing to say that is, be, is to clear up uh, the, the, how to get these installed. The department prefers to use variances. But one of the problems with variances is that there, we're being asked to be, have variances from rules and standards that don't apply to this technology. And so we're specifically saying you don't need a variance to install this. Um, in fact, the department supports and often recommends that before doing video logging, you run a garden hose into the well to clear it out for video logging. But yet when we're proposing put it in a tube and recirculating, it's become a source of contamination. And so you can get a variance uh, for other parts of the code, and we're proposing to not, to specifically say you don't need that. Um, Mr. Chair, that's the bill. Uh, we have uh, talked with the department last year. I want to let the members know. I forget when this was. It was over Zoom. It was very complicated last year. But we try to work out language at the department. At one point, one of the department representatives told me, that's not our job. So we haven't had a very good discussion with them about the legislation. We're open to working with them to try to get this, this language. But that's what we ran into last year. And so members, that's uh, our presentation. And again, if you have technicals, I have folks from the company here that can help you. Thank you, Mr. Clavin. We do have uh, Mr. Dan Huff with us from the department. Uh, Mr. Huff, if you would like to uh, offer your testimony and as we are looking at the clock if uh, we don't want to cut you short but if you got a way to speed it up that's just great thank you and go ahead with your testimony uh, thank you mr. chair committee members my name is uh, Dan Hoff I'm one of the assistants here at the Minnesota Department of Health um, we very much appreciate the innovation and the innovative uh, Darcy this company is providing uh, we definitely support innovation, and we uh, support those uh, uh, innovations, especially that help us uh, our carbon footprint, increase our efficiency. Um, we do have concerns about this bill as proposed, um, and that is because we are charged with protecting our groundwater and our drinking water, and uh, we believe that this uh, bill as proposed does not provide the adequate protections. Um, that we have for other geothermal systems. And if you will permit me, uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to describe the other two uh, types of systems, geothermal systems, 
that are permitted by the Department of Health. The first one's called a board geothermal heat exchanger. And the way that works is you, it is a closed loop system. And uh, you drill a, a field, underground uh, geothermal field. And this is set at least 50 feet away from any drinking water well. And what we do, to, since it is a sealed system, we don't want anything to leak out. So that is in case in grout cement. So all the way down, it is encased in cement so that if any of that pipe were to rupture, it would not leak out. Or if there were contaminants in the soil, they would not leak in. That's how we protect that system away from a drinking water well and its case sealed up in our cement. We have another system that is called a groundwater thermal exchange device. Now this is somewhat similar in that it actually goes into, or rather it pulls from a supply well. But this is an open system. So water comes up from a supply well, it goes through the heat exchanger, say in the house, and then it goes right back down into the system with, uh, uh, as an injection. Because it's a, a continuous flow, we don't have the water doesn't stagnate or have the opportunity to foul. And um, there we had a 50 foot set setback from any contamination sources. For example, sewer. You don't want to have a leaky sewer pipe then enter and then contaminate a loop system if it was there. So we have these, these different types of systems that are currently allowed in the permit. Now, NDH has actually authorized four uh, uh, applications from Darcy through our variance process. The variance process allows us to take innovative solutions, make sure that proper safety standards are applied so we can begin to learn and make sure the systems work effectively. Here's our concerns with the closed loop potable system. Potable water is potable once it comes out of the tap, but once you put it in a sealed tube that circulates around indefinitely, that water can easily foul. That means any bacteria within that will begin to grow um, and foul the water. In your uh, pipes, pipes are always moving, those are chlorinated, that prevents water in your house pipes from falling. Not the case here. Any leak there will just enter into the, the groundwater, actually into the well itself, because there's no grout around it. So we have um, sort of the two dangers of these two systems combined with none of the protections that we have in the two other permitted systems. We uh, want to continue to work with Darcy, continue to um, prove through various process as we learn how this new technology works and as we work with them to find ways to see if there is a way to make this one of the permitted possibilities. We do not feel it is appropriate to have one type of system that is not required a permit while all the contractors in the state who use one of the other two systems do have to permit and do have to meet those safety standards. Um, so we are concerned. We feel this is undue risk to our drinking water supply. And we feel that it sets an unfair advantage to all of the other contractors who are going through the process of permitting uh, and have uh, multiple safety checks in place to protect green. Thank you, Mr. Huff. And I'm, I'm going to, before I go to Senator Nelson, just add my own little comment. Um, we, we got, we heard just about everything you said, but you would miss a word or two here and there because of uh, the connection. So I would highly encourage you and all the rest of the members of your department uh, to join us here in person so that we can hear everything you say uh, when you testify. But uh, we did get the, the gist of what you had there. And uh, with that, uh, Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't want to take too much time here, but I think Mr. Huff made the case why this bill is needed. Uh, the current structure for the geothermal heat exchanger and the groundwater thermal exchanger devices do not fit 
what the new innovations are. And to say that any new innovation must not be allowed because it would be an unfair advantage, well, that means we would still be looking at horse and buggies. I'm just saying we cannot disallow innovations because they are innovations. But I do want to address the safety concerns because I do believe that's something that we all are very interested in. And just to note that um, certainly, just like the uh, municipal uh, water systems with water recirculating, there's no difference in what would be done here in these um, geothermal uh, groundwater loops. And of course, if there was a, if it was a necessity to uh, say that uh, they needed to be uh, exchanged or flushed every once in, in a certain amount of time, certainly that is something that could be entertained. But the department has not come up with any of those recommendations yet. But again, I just caution members uh, about the idea that any innovations um, would be considered not appropriate because they would be an unfair advantage. Well, we like innovations. That is what's going to help us get to a more renewable energy, cleaner energy. Uh, and I also would like, I know Mr. Clavin has a, a quick comment as well, Mr. Chair. Mr. Clavin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. On the variance issue, when we look at it, anything on a regulated community, a PCA, feedlots, wastewater treatment plants, anything, there are rules that folks can understand. We're going out to a customer trying to put in a, a system and we say, now just wait, we have to get a variance from the Department of Health if they feel like granting it, but we don't have any measurable standards. That's a little tough to run the business. So operating by variance is almost impossible. And that's the struggle we're facing. And that's why we're here in front of you today, trying to get some sideboards on this thing, some framework to move the technology forward while protecting the aquifer at the same time. We're all interested in that. So the variance, the variance route is not a business tenable way to run. Thank you. Uh, Senator Benson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hoff, can you tell me how many applications have there been for the closed loop? Mr. Hoff? I know, Mr. Hoff, did you hear the question? Uh, Mr. Chair, can you repeat the question, please? Yep, yeah, Senator Benson. Um, Mr. Huff, how many submerged closed loop heat exchanger uh, applications have there been? Mr. Huff. Mr. Chair, Senator Benson, um, there have been nine applications. Five of those, no, four of those are were withdrawn. One application is pending and being. Four of those were approved with a variance. Not, uh, none of those systems have been fully implemented. Um, so we do not have an actual system operating for us to um, begin to uh, evaluate. Senator Benson. Thank you. And Mr. Huff, uh, why were the four withdrawn? Do you know? Mr. Huff. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Benson, you would have to ask the applicant. It okay. was uh, withdrawn by the applicant. Okay. Senator Thank Benson. Um, and Mr. Huff, have you assisted them in giving them some structure so that when they approach building one of these systems, they can have some sense of um, confidence that as they put forth an application that they have some chance of success? Mr. Huff? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Benson, we have a standardized variance process um, that we have shared with the applicant, and uh, our staff will review that and uh, make comments back. Senator Benson. So, and Mr. Chair, I just think some regulatory certainty would be helpful, even if something's innovative, having some sense of how far the setbacks are going to be. Um, you know, what are your criteria instead of just this is our variance process, um, roll the dice, see what happens. So, um, Mr. Chair, if we're going to, if the department is going to micromanage innovation, they should at least be clear as to what those regulations are going to be. Senator Draham. 
Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Nelson, for, for picking up the torch on this one. Uh, you know, just a couple quick comments. I know we're out of time. Um, I just want to remind members that if you look at this sheet, who the partners are on this project, uh, pretty impressive list uh, of people uh, that are trying to help innovate a green, energy-efficient way of heating and cooling. Um, and once again, the state is standing in the way. Um, for those of you who don't develop or build very often and, and have to go and get a variance, variances are costly and they are also uh, very time sensitive and could delay a project. And when you're working with contractors, which are hard to get, it only complicates it more. So I urge a yes vote on this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Senator Wickland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to just make a comment because I know we're, we're out of um, much of our committee time. Um, it sounded like um, from um, Commissioner Huff's testimony that a couple other different types of uh, geothermal heat exchange systems are um, possible to build today. And the second one he talked about, it did sound like that used um, water actually drawn up and, and through a system and back down into the earth, if I understood it correctly. Um, and that it seems like in that case, there would have been some discussion about um, the water getting contaminated as it goes through the, the process in that, um, in that setting. So it, it, it seems to me here, we, you have a system that is similar in some ways to that. The water is circulating. There is a chance, a very small chance, it sounds like, of leakage. But if the concern is that the water is going to get contaminated within the, the building facility heat transfer um, system, that, that that should be something you can discuss and figure out a way to mitigate. And so um, the other things I've heard about the setbacks, and it seems to me that there are um, different restrictions in place to protect um, drinking water systems as far as minimum setbacks that, that cities are, have to own property um, that makes them own like a 50-foot setback. Um, so, I mean, some of these things are controls that are already in place in law today. It just seems like this particular solution um, doesn't um, sound like it deviates a great deal from that, that there should be some way to work out a way to develop an Im implementation method that would protect water in a way that that, that second um, type of system, and I don't know, what, I don't remember what the name he used for that, but it seems like there ought to be a way to develop a, a method of implementa implementation that would be safe. So I guess my comment is that I hope that we, that there is continued discussion about a way to do that in a rational way. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, my question really comes out of the comments by the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, my concern mirrors theirs in that um, the concerns about contaminating drinking water, and I'm wondering if there's any data that um, represents that this system has ever shown to um, produce any contaminated water or is this just a thing that might happen that nobody really knows? Senator Nelson, or we've got a new uh, phone a friend that joined you. Is, yep. is are you uh, Mr. Larson? My name is Alex Martel. Okay, Alex. Welcome, did you catch the question? If you could just, um, and we're gonna ask people to kind of be I'll as be brief as possible, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Eden. So there, there is not If you could just identify yourself, please. Thank you. My name is Alex Martel. I'm the Director of Operations with Darcy Solutions. And just very briefly by way of background, I did spend some time with the well management section at the Department of Health between 2015 and 2022. So my regulatory perspective can hopefully provide some clarity here. 
Uh, we do not have data that would show any um, contamination from our system. And I would just ask as kind of a follow-up question to that is, you know, what constituents of fouled water would we really be concerned about? Um, and that's, that's all I, I guess, the end of that. Senator Eaton, anything else? Okay. I guess that, that takes care of it. Uh, Senator Nelson, if you want to give us just a really short uh, wrap up or if you'd prefer just to make your motion um, then sure. we can finish it. We have one more bill we'll like oh, to I'll, address. Thank you, it. Mr. Chair. I'll just be very clear. Again, this is just a new water well definition. Um, and again, uh, setbacks are already uh, in law for uh, current geothermal at 15. Uh, this uses as existing well permit is what we're seeking to do. And um, I, I would just ask the committee, um, I'll renew my motion uh, that this be referred to pass and, set to and sent to finance. Okay, uh, thank you, Senator Nelson. And uh, well, I'm on the, I'm just double checking here. Okay, that your motion would be that Senate file 1919 be passed as amended and re referred to the Finance Committee. So with that, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Senator Nelson and your testifiers. Um, and we've got one more bill here, um, Senate File 295, brought to us by Senator Dreheim. We will try to uh, get that information in front of us so that we can finish that up here before we head out. We did let people know we were going to be going uh, up to possibly 250, and we're going to get there. So, Senator Dreheim. If you would like to uh, move your bill. I would like to move Senate file 295. Okay. And if Go I could, ahead with okay. the uh, uh, testimony or the, uh, the description of your sure. bill. Sure. Yep. Members, I, I'm just trying to move uh, the overseeing of radon into where most of the construction is already at. Um, and I don't, we don't have much time. Um, but Department of Labor and Industry oversees most of the licensing and enforcing of our construction process. And radon got lumped in with MDH, which is great for the scientific pieces. They can still do that if they want to. But for licensing, it should belong with the rest of the trade licensing. Uh, and that's all I'm trying to do, is move it from one agency to another. And if you look on their website, the Department of Labor and Industry website, the Construction Codes and Licensing Division provides for regulation and enforcement of construction-related health and safety codes and licensing law and new and existing structures. That's all I'm trying to do. Thank you, Chair and members. I will go to the testifiers if it's okay with you. Okay, um, thank you, Senator Dreheim, and welcome to our committee. I'm not sure, are you uh, Mr. Erickson? Yes, I am. Okay, welcome to our committee. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Nick Erickson. I'm the Director of Research and Regulatory Affairs at Housing First Minnesota. We represent uh, Minnesota contractors, renovators, developers, uh, individuals who are uh, uh, working every day to make sure we all have a place to call home. Um, I'll be as brief as possible because I know we are running up to uh, the committee's deadline here. But um, you know, radon is a uh, odorless gas. It is the number two um, cause of lung cancer, uh, you know, second to smoking. Uh, this bill, um, our, and our support of Senator Dreheim's bill is not about the health effects, it is about really what is this uh, you know, process. And essentially it is a construction procedure. Uh, just to clarify a few things, because I know there were a few senators confused in a previous stop. Um, what we are talking about here is the, the work of, of um, renovation and installation of a radon mitigation system. Um, I know some senators told me last time they thought maybe this was done by scientists. This is being done by licensed contractors. We're talking about uh, drilling into a home to install pipes. This does involve going deep past the foundation. This is construction-related work. All of this is generally covered by the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. Um, 
which you know they do building codes and contractor licensing. Uh, this. Interestingly, the uh, building officials uh, in Minnesota have been previously been exempt from a lot of the radon licensing. Uh, M DLI also uh, oversees the uh, management of building officials. Um, just also wanted to note that you know we've seen a lot of work on consolidating a lot of our construction codes over the, the past few decades. You know, we now have the energy code has shifted from commerce to DLI. I think no one opposes that move now. I believe uh, Plumbing Code may have once in a time had a greater tie to health that is now uh, also housed with the Board of Plumbing at uh, Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. So I'll be brief and stand for any technical questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Uh, next up, we have uh, Scott McClellan joining us uh, via Zoom. So welcome to our committee. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Scott McClellan. I'm the state building official and director of construction codes and licensing for the Department of Labor and Industry. Thank you. I'll be very brief. As we've testified previously, the department uh, does not support this bill because we believe protecting public safety from radon can best be accomplished through the subject matter experts and the existing infrastructure at the Department of Health. Two reasons for this. First, the state building code that we enforce to protect public safety governs construction, remodeling, and additions. So once a building is approved for occupancy, that closes our involvement unless there's subsequent remodeling. We don't regulate or step back into existing buildings. Second, to accomplish our statutory charge to protect public safety, the department employs industry experts such as builders, building inspectors, architects, engineers, licensed electricians, et cetera, uh, construction experts. We know construction and our industry experts provide the best possible service that the public deserves in the construction of new buildings and the remodeling. So in this way, that building science professionals at the Department of Health protect public safety and the safe indoor use of existing buildings, such as in their regulation of radon, lead paint, formaldehyde, and other indoor contaminants. So we each have our specialized areas of expertise that ultimately we believe best benefits the public and provides for their safety. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next up, we have Mr. Huff, Department of Health. Uh, thank Welcome. you, Mr. Chair, committee members, um, and I appreciate my colleague at uh, DLI um, comments. We at MDH do performative-based uh, contract work. That is, we look at the performance. We measure before and we measure after. And the work that we're all involved in is a health hazard. Radon mitigation is only done radon testing shows that radon levels are too high and may lead to lung cancer. We then work with the contractor to make sure that the system installed doesn't meet a prescriptive code, that is you use this amp of fan and this big of a pipe, but rather that it meets the performance standards. Does it actually do the job of removing the radon gas? It's powerless. It's odorless and it'll cause cancer in. There's no way for a homeowner to know if the work is done correctly unless we do that post testing. We at MDH also license the folks who actually do the testing and we license the lab as a package so that we are looking at the entire process and it is performative, just like we do with asbestos, just like we do with lead, other indoor health hazards. We feel uh, we already have the system established. It would be disruptive to take this, move it to another agency, costly um, and really unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Benson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have the FTE question once again. Why, if we're transferring responsibilities, is it going to take more people? Uh, uh, Senator Drayheim, I, I'm I, guessing I you didn't craft that, the fiscal note. So, yeah. yeah. I, Senator Benson and Chair Ucky, um, great question. And this is our not our first stop with this bill. And um, Chapter 15 does talk about moving 
uh, rules and responsibility over from one agency over to another and we feel that this would be a, a perfect example how it could be moved over and just some clarifying comments Minnesota uses what most of the country uses is the federal guidelines for radon so if you've bought or sold a house you've probably had a radon test and we're not trying to interfere with that we're not trying to interfere with the process or how it's done it's just where it's licensed. In, in previous stops, we heard um, from uh, Senator Howe, who this is what he does for a living, is inspect buildings. And he's never sem seen MDH <laughs> actually out testing for radon at a project. Neither have I. And, and I have been in literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes at buildings. They don't come out and do the testing as a rule. They set the guidelines, they set the testing, um, they set the permits. That can still be done. So all I'm saying is let's move this with the rest of the construction. So it's all under one house. Uh, Department of Labor Industry works with contractors day in and day out all over the state. And that, that's just where it, it should be housed. That's, that's it. But as far as the FTEs go, Senator Benson, I still question that, why it would take double the FTEs from one agency to the other. Senator Thank Benson. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, and I looked up the original language from, looks like the 2015 HHS omnibus bill. And it's been the practice of this committee for as long as I've been here, except for some of the work in Senator Abler's jurisdiction that fees cover the cost in the department. So they've been collecting fees and it looks like only 1.75 FTEs have been applied to this task. Now we're going to a new agency and it's gonna take four. And so I've asked Mr. Albrecht to get me the original fiscal note because if you relieve a department of responsibility, you should also relieve them of the special revenue and the personnel that were in that fiscal note. And so, um, Mr. Chair, I think we move this out and we can get the, the other fiscal note for finance. Okay, thank you. And I just, uh, okay, we got, yep, I'll be right with you, Senator Wickland. One comment I had as I was listening to both Mr. McClellan and Mr. Huff talk about, you know, if, first of all, with the Department of Labor, if they don't get called out, they don't know about it, they wouldn't have a permit, et cetera neither department will know about this issue. I mean, it's up to that homeowner or the contractor to call and open a permit. Um, and so the fact that one or the other, they're, they're gonna be equal. Um, if there's a job that comes up, um, you know, and if the homeowner wants to do it themselves and be totally anonymous, they've got that right or if they take and go forward and get a building permit, then the different agencies would be noted. So for one to pass the buck to the other one, um, it's, it, it's not acceptable. I don't buy it, but anyhow that you can take on to your next stop and your next committee and discuss further. I do want to get to uh, Senator Wicklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say that I, I think that this, um, I have to say I think that this um, skill set and and activity should reside within MDH. What what I've heard today doesn't persuade me that it should be moved over to the, the other department. Um, what the other department um, commissioner said um, indicates that they they understand how to build things to a standard and they enforce those standards. Um, but what I I'm hearing from the Department of Health is that they have contained within, within their agency the things that um, are health impacting um, uh, areas, asbestos, radon, others, that um, they need specialized um, scientists to be able to understand the impacts as well as to regulate those who are doing the work to, um, to test for them and to do the abatement work. So I guess from the information that I'm hearing today, I'm not persuaded that that makes sense to move them over to a different agency, especially when um, work like lead, asbestos, um, other air quality issues are handled within the Department of Health. Thank you. Senator Drahan. Thank you, Senator Wicklund, for your comments. Um, th this would just be for the licensing for the contractors. 
if the Department of Health continue wants to continue on with the research with most of the stuff you mentioned wouldn't be included in this. This is only with radon. That's it. Nothing to do with formaldehyde or lead or asbestos or anything else that you mentioned. Just radon licensing. That's it. Um, I have asked over a month ago, probably six weeks ago, for a list of who works in this area from the department, and I have not received that yet. Because when I had this a bill last year, we did not hear this. This was this is brand new. So it must have came up in the, in the last year. They started doing all this good work. They do not go out and test as a rule. They use third-party people that go out and do the tests in your home. And we're just trying to put it all under one roof to make sure the people actually doing the work have great communication within an agency that they work with every day. But thank you for your comments, Senator Wicklund. Senator Drayheim, if you'd like to uh, renew your motion, um, we can get you off to your next stop so these conversations can continue and you can continue to work with all the parties. Thank you, uh, Chair Aki and members, for, for the time today. I, I would like to move that Senate File 295 be recommended to pass and sent to the Finance Committee. Members, we have the motion before us. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion passes. Thank you, Senator Draheim. Thank you. And thank you, members. Uh, we uh, went beyond the extension that we'd even planned on, so I thank you for sticking with us. Um, with that, we will be adjourned.